Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, that twice weekly podcast for the needlework artist. And my guest this week is Claire Hunter of Sewing Matters. Hi, Claire. Hi there, Gary. And Claire from Glasgow, Scotland, and also author of the book Threads of Life A History of the World Through the Eye of a Needle. And this is uh, going to be show, show one of two. So uh, this week we're going to talk with Claire just to learn about her, her needlework career, uh, what she's done as a, in the community and to further needlework uh, in, in her world. And then uh, next week we'll devote the entire time to talking about her book, Threads of Life. And um, uh, that that's a book I, uh, I've said to, to several people, and Claire included, I just think is a tremendous piece of literature and highly recommend that you uh, that, uh, that people buy this book and read it. Threads of Life. I um, uh, I am not a nonfiction reader at all. Uh, I find it <laughs> most times. I have several nonfiction books that I have uh, started and never finished. But this one, uh, I thought, all right, I'm going to read it because I want to talk to Claire about it, and ended up just locked into it. It's really very well done and fascinating stories and and uh, bits of history and. Highly recommend that people uh, go get that uh, Threads of Life. So we'll talk about that next week in depth. But this week we want to learn about Claire. And so we're going to do that. And this week sponsored by the Attic Needle Workshop in Mesa, Arizona. So thanks to Jean Lee and, and her uh, team there for sponsoring the show. And call your attention to what I think is a really nice sampler their November Sampler of the Month is Cordelia Ransbury, 1847, from Samplers Remembered. And if you, uh, as always, when we talk about uh, the attic, the, the, be- the, me- the website, just don't even bother with that. Go to the website so that you can, so that you can sign up for the newsletter because you want to get the newsletter because it's eye candy every month for people who like samplers and actually any cross stitch but that's where the action is at with the needle uh, with the uh, attic needle workshop is this, the the uh, newsletter so get that and then you will know what's going on at the attic all the time and so uh, the sampler of the month Cordelia Ransbury and then uh if you are a male type stitcher and live in or will be in the Phoenix area in January, we're going to have a men's night at the attic. Uh, we're working on the date right now, date and time, but we're going to have a night at the attic. Uh, Gene and I are putting our heads together. We're going to have a night at the attic for men to come and stitch. And uh, understand there's several men in the uh, Phoenix area, and I'll be there visiting our son, and so we're going to have a men's night at the attic in January. So uh, keep in touch with us and with the attic to learn the date and time we'll be getting that out very soon and then uh also june 4 to 6 this is something that it, there's still room in this uh, activity the bristol needlework from paper to fabric event bristol needlework from paper to fabric and that's with claudia dutcher of dutch treat designs and vicky and megan Janet of needlework press and so we're going to, you want to, if you can get in on that, please do it. Contact the Attic Needle Workshop and uh, uh, sign yourself up because you want to hear, you want to hear Claudia. And if you've listened to our, our show uh, last week with Claudia and then a show we did a while back with Megan, Megan and Vicki, uh, you want to hear both of them talk about samplers and, and particularly paper, uh, paper-based samplers. So uh, uh, check that out on June 4 to 6 and get that, uh, get that uh, newsletter from the attic. Get on the, on the list so that you get that because it's, it's just fun to read. It's just fun to read, but have your credit card ready at all times. So thanks to the attic for sponsoring us. And Claire Needlework, you, you've done... <laughs> amazing things and you know I, I in in this world of fiber talk 99 percent of the time we talk about uh needlework in terms of of projects uh, cross stitch design samplers needlepoint uh, hard anger whatever it might be but you you are you approach needlework in a much broader 
sense in in terms of embroidery with the broadest definition uh banners and really anything that's sewn how how does this all get started for you well i suppose it got started like for a lot of people i was taught to sew by my mother interestingly she didn't teach me plain sewing she taught me embroidery and I think she taught me that because she was there. My, my father worked away a lot. She was there with four children. I was the youngest. I was perhaps over curious, asking too many questions. And she thought, actually, you know, a little bit of embroidery would settle her down. And <laughs> <laughs> OK, we got to occupy this little mind. <laughs> So she took me to, in Glasgow in those days where I was brought up, there was a, a wonderful um, craft shop uh, and uh, called Miller's. And she took me to Miller's, and I was probably about six years of age. She took me there, and she bought me embroidery threads. She bought me those, in those days, you used to be able to get little tray cloths or dressing table cloths that were already stamped with usually floral designs. And then she bought me those little gold t needles and little scissors that uh, you are know, embroidery scissors that looked like the, the the handles looked like the, the bird's wings, mm -hmm. and made made it like I was being given treasure. <laughs> and, and you know how embroidery threads are usually displayed in a carousel of colours, and let me you know she let me choose my own colours from that, and I went home clutching this bag, which as I say was just like a wee Aladdin's cave to me of 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 of, of because the material jewel, you know. <laughs> and, um, and I found when I started, and she taught me very simple stitches, just kind of lazy daisy stitch and French knot and, and stitches like that, fern stitch, blanket stitch. And I just loved it. I found it so absorbing. I loved the fact that you had a cream or a white cloth. And then within just a few hours, it was festooned with flowers. I found that quite miraculous as a child. And, of course, once I'd learned how to do that, then I began to have the best dressed dolls in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. So she created a monster then. You just took that and ran with it. And for her, of course, it was great because then of an evening I would settle down with my embroidery as she had hoped. <laughs> and so engrossed in that, I'd forget to ask the 55 questions that I usually bombarded her with. <laughs> um, and and with you know and making dolls dresses then I, I was very interested in, in uh, historical costume. We used to go to museums a lot, and I loved all those big dresses. And, of course, you had things like Gone with the Wind, you know, these huge kind of, you know, um, amazing dresses that, that they had in the film. And so I used to, again, for my dolls, make dresses that were encrusted with beads and embroidery and anything I could throw at them and petticoats and ruffs and all those things. So I was always into quite fancy needlework. But I then did move on as a teenager to making my own clothes and then beginning to make clothes for the family, etc. So, okay, so that did then, that little uh, start of embroidery then blossomed into that uh, larger sewing. Larger sewing. And, um, and also, I, we all used to make presents for people at Christmas. Um, so for me, making something out of fabric became a, a very normal thing to do. So I was always looking for different ways to use fabric to make, you know, a stationary case or uh, um, a, a tea cosy or, you know, something that I could make out of fabric that would be different, would be unusual and would be you know, a gift from me, you know, very much had my stamp on it. And I love doing that as well. And I still do that. Now, did you... Uh... Did your family have a sewing machine so that you had that to work with, or was this all just about all handwork? No, my mother had a, uh, had a Singer sewing machine, as as most homes did. And then at school, we got uh, taught plain sewing, very plain sewing, white and white, hemming, you know, very dull aprons. And we used to do that on um, the old Singer um, you know, treadle machines ah. with, <laughs> them with your feet. And interestingly enough, although I thought I was confident that I was great at sewing, I really could not master the treadle machine because I'm not very well coordinated. <laughs> and so I had to get my friend Liz to sneak me in at lunchtime to give me special lessons. And then once I had mastered that, then actually, again, I loved that rhythm. It's a bit like, I suppose, people who do spinning. You know, it has such a rhythm to it. Um, and, and so I loved the feel of it and the pace of it, actually. 
Yeah, that that those treadle machines, uh, learning how to do those to me is like learning how to be a drummer, where you have to do the bass, <laughs> the bass drum, and then all, and then the sticks on top, and keep it all coordinated. I, I'd probably have trouble with that too. Yes, because you're rocking with your feet, and then you're putting the the, the material through very steadily with your hands. But eventually, because in those days I couldn't afford to buy um, an electric sewing machine, I then bought myself a treadle machine, and I had that for about twenty years. Yeah, and and it probably never broke down. Yeah, those... It never broke down, absolutely. And then eventually it got recycled into. There's a wonderful kinetic artist in Glasgow, and uh, he makes these amazing uh, sculptural, you know, uh, moving parts of of um, of, of let's say sculpture. And I donated my sewing machine to him, and he took it apart and used various parts for one of his amazing pieces. So it so it lives on in a different form. So, so, so it rocks on in a different form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see, moving moving your feet on that treadle and and not moving your hands in rhythm with that is yeah, that'd be a challenge. <laughs> yeah. So then the, the sewing obviously then and needlework in general just carried on right through your teen years and right into adulthood. It's carried on right through life, Gary. Um it's it's my kind of it's both has become my profession. But even though it is my profession, I'll finish making a banner during the day or working on a banner during the day and then still pick up another piece of needlework, usually, again, hand-stitching at night um, because I just, I, I, it's just part of me. It's an extension of me, really, I suppose. Yeah. What, uh, what kind of handwork do you do? Surface embroidery? Uh, I do surface embroidery, but interestingly, recently, I've turned to patchwork, which I've never done before. Uh, because I, I suppose I've always been interested in making smaller things, but having the children, um, and my two are just about to turn 21, and of course I thought, well, actually it'd be nice for them to have, you know, a patchwork quilt that I've made them. And interestingly, I'm not making them anything complex. I'm making a very traditional for my daughter, just small, uh, small hexagons in, in lovely fabric, uh, done with the paper templates, all hand sewn. And um, and so I'm working away at that, that at the moment. And then for uh, friends who have just got married, I've just made them uh, a lovely quilt, just machined actually, in using a silk tartan. Mm. Uh, and so it's, it absolutely glows. It's, 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 it's beautiful colours. So just different tartans, uh, because they live again in a Scottish glen. And I thought for their, for their wedding present, it'd be lovely for them to have all these different tartans together. So that's what I'm working on. So one's machine and, and the other one's hand. And for my son, I've, I'm making another hand one for him. Uh huh. Yeah, see, that takes me back. My grandma used to make the, the hand quilts, and she would do it from old shirts and, and other fabrics. And we have a couple of those that still today. And several of the little squares or triangles or whatever, uh, I can re still remember what shirt that came from or what piece of cloth uh uh, still carry those memories. That's right, and of course, because it's both tactile and visual, then it, 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 it kind of evokes her and your childhood so much more vividly yeah. you know, through yeah. touching it and seeing it. I wish, of course, I had kept pieces of fabric for everything that I'd made through life. That would be a, a, a kind of visual memory, you know? Oh, yeah, for, for you, that'd be a, a real trip down memory road. No kidding. Well, sadly, I never thought of it until now. <laughs> oh well <laughs> yeah that's uh but that's a that that whole hand quilting you know there's a real skill there I've, I've sat down and studied my grandmother's stitching and holy smokes grandma <laughs> that's good stuff but you know years and years and years of doing it by hand and uh you either get good or you go home and that's right well we went my my husband's aunt who's now elderly we went to help her clear out what was the family house and I discovered in the attic in an old trunk a patchwork quilt. And when I counted the number of hexagons in that, there were 6,000 hexagons that made up that quilt. And the stitching is minuscule. It's so tiny. It's so beautifully done. Unbelievable. Yeah, that. Um, uh, I, I, what I'll do, folks, is I'll make a slideshow of photos that uh, Claire has provided. And one of them is that quilt and is one of the more unbelievable things I've ever seen. Those that's the the time and the effort to put that thing together is frightening. <laughs> and you can imagine, you know, I would imagine it was made by a group of women 
sitting together in the light of the afternoon, sitting, gossiping, chatting, sorting life out together. And I like that that sensation that, that they've they've put their kind of uh, friendship and gathering into that quilt. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, that's part of it too. Yep. Uh, supporting exactly. each other, talking about it, getting through the days. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and making this thing together. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Did um did this all generate an art interest for you in school? Do you, did you develop an art background, or has this always just come out of you naturally? No, when I when I was at school, I I really really wanted to do art and what we called then domestic science, which included sewing, as my kind of specialist subjects. But I was also academic, and so my teachers were absolutely appalled at the idea that I would look to have any career in sewing, which because I was very keen to become something like a, a theatre costume maker, mm -hmm. designer, or even go into the fashion industry. And so that that was absolutely thrown out the window. There was absolutely no way I was going to be allowed to do that. And so I never got to pursue it. And instead, I went to university. I did uh, English and history. But then in my final year, I took drama as a subject, as one of my subjects for my final degree. And I fell in love with theatre. So in actual fact, then I went to theatre school. And in that, although I was I, I was trained to be a theatre director and stage manager, I did then also get some chance to make some theatre costumes, to design and make some theatre costumes. So in that way, my sewing skills came in use in a different kind of way. They, they were not going to stop you, were they? They were not going to stop. They were, sewing was not going to be taken away from me. <laughs> And then eventually I did make it my profession, but that was after years of being in theater and in arts. Yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting that uh, uh, no matter who tries to send you down another path, you you ended up back there. I think that's true, isn't it? That actually we don't, the, the things that when we're a child, well, things that we love, then we, we it's lovely when you can reclaim them later in life. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's... Um, we see that in needlework a lot where people are taught, mainly uh, females, taught at a young age to sew or stitch or any any number of those kinds of things. And then it goes away from them as they get through high school and college and uh, get through their young adult years. And then there, there seems for so many of them to be some moment in life when that pops back into their heads and back into their lives and then and then they uh, take it up again and realize how relaxing it is and rewarding it is. And if they hadn't had that early on, it may never have happened. Yes, I think if you've had it early on, when you take it by a cup, you've got a confidence in just some of, some of the basic techniques so you can actually create something, even if you've not done it for years and years, like riding a bicycle, when you pick it up again, you're quite confident about how you can do it. Obviously, people are more terrified about whether they can be creative with it. That's, you know, people sometimes are, are, are worried they won't be creative enough with it. But the lovely thing about sewing is that you can make something beautiful just with a piece of fabric and running stitch. Right. You know, right. it doesn't have to be complicated, you know. Yeah, and I think that's that's interesting. I, I That's been in my head reading your book and just uh, doing research for this is that very thing is uh, I get in my own needlework, get so focused on the project of the moment and doing it just right. And then I see all the examples of needlework that uh, you have researched or been involved in. And so much of it is, is not that it's yes. you cut out a piece of fabric, uh, make a, a shape or a pattern, sew it down. sew uh, a few lines, but deliver a message, deliver something from your heart or your mind and whether it looks like it's absolutely professionally done uh, is really not relevant it's the message and you don't want it to look as if it's been manufactured you want to have the evidence of hands there and i love pieces that have got personality still there somebody recently gave me a, a little doll uh, she's a, she is a, a graduate of art school but she makes these really anarchic dolls that are, you know, huge buttons for eyes, rough buttonhole stitching around them using all sorts of different kinds of fabrics and wool and different things. And they are fantastic because they are so crazy, you know. Um, <laughs> and it's rough stitching, deliberately rough stitching. And it really works. 
Mm-hmm. And so I say that to people who are afraid, don't be, don't try and make your needlework um, neat and perfect. Do it so it has your personality. Now, your personality might be neat and perfect, but your personality might not be that. So try and make it feel like your personality and you'll have much more fun with it. Yeah, and that's that's where I I have that neat and perfect problem. So uh, <laughs> I have to I have to go that route. But um yeah, I think it is it's exactly that. Have, have fun with it. Make sure you're enjoying it before you do anything else. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Did you stay with theater for very long? Um I I I didn't really I was in theater for about 3 years. Um, and then I got the opportunity to become the director of an art centre in Salisbury. And that had been a medieval church, which was uh, um, basically had been made redundant. And the community so wanted to save that building, which was a beautiful building, but also held so many memories of their own marriages or grandparents, baptisms, etc., within it. And so they then decided that they would claim that building and turn it into an art centre. And I was very privileged to become the first director of that whole project. And that, of course, led me into working with the community. And I became from that much more interested in how the arts and the communities could be connected to create things that were really interesting. Okay, because I could not find where that turning point was for you. So it was the honour of being the first person to get this uh, museum on its feet and, and build it up, that, well, uh, that, that yeah. opened the door to the community interaction for you. That's right. It was an, it was an art centre that ran a whole programme of theatre and music and, um, and craft activities and, and writing classes, a whole range of different craft activities, but it was all community run apart from myself and a part-time secretary. So everybody was a volunteer in that project. There were over 100 people, and they ran and and, um, uh, selected the music programme or the drama programme, which was professional. They would bring in professional companies. Um, And then um, people with different skills would run. We had a pottery. We had, um, as I say, we had writing classes. We had all sorts of different activities. We had a young art centre. And again, they programmed that whole centre themselves with my help. And it was a fantastic project. And the Art Centre still continues in Salisbury, which is wonderful, which is where it was in Salisbury in England. Um, so that led me into really having a, an interest. And at that point in Britain, there was a burgeoning movement, which was called Community Arts, which was really about artists using their skills to help local people find their creative voices and tell of their experiences and their histories through the arts and make those much more public, particularly for those communities that were most annexed from public life or were disenfranchised in different ways. And I just found that very inspiring, how much imagination, how many skills there were out there in different communities that were unexpressed. And if I could use my um, skills to help those be expressed, then I thought that was a very worthwhile way to live yeah, and isn't that that is so true? Time and time again, we know people uh, through work or church or whatever it might be, and we know them for who they are in that environment. But time and time again, we learn that these people have another life that is is absolutely interesting. Like there's a, a young lady that I work with in my uh, magazine publishing uh, world who does PR for a large corporation. And I just learned the other day that she's a very accomplished collage artist. Oh yes, interesting. And I didn't know I didn't know you could do that kind of work, the kind of work she does with collage. And she's not the kind of person you would think in a million years would do that kind of thing. Just doesn't give that impression because you deal with her in the work environment and just conducting business. And yes. uh, and and so yeah, you trip over these things and. And I'm, I'm sure once you get into a situation like the art center, you discover this this incredible other world right in the community. Absolutely, and particularly you find out, you know, a lot of older people who have, you know, who have extraordinary skills because they've 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 come through life quite often in a craft industry of some description, and then they've been made redundant or they've come unemployed, and but those skills stay with them and. And again, for older people, it's difficult to become an active, often to take an active part in public life and to have your skills and achievements 
um, recognised and acknowledged and expressed, as I say. And so I found by devising projects through which that could happen and also projects by which different generations could, could come together. Uh, so children learning from older people sewing skills or learning from them drawing skills. I mean, it was fantastic. Yeah, and, and those people are always so willing to teach and show. It's teach and show and, and, and so enjoy that being uh, young people being receptive to what it is they've got to offer. That had oh, that had to have been a, a a lot of fun to uh, get that art center going and watch that thing develop. That's right. I mean, I remember one project we did there where we had a hundred children, and basically we uh, we we had, we brought them into the art center, which, if you imagine, it was a big empty nave of a church. Right. And then we said that there was a tribe that had lived in uh in, in farmland outside of Salisbury. And but they had been uh, basically they they had been lost. This tribe had been lost centuries before, and what we needed to do was to set up teams of archaeologists, of um, uh, curators, and go explore there and find what we could ev what evidence we could of this particular tribe, and then create a museum uh, um, that was basically. Um, uh, celebrated them and what we had done of course was go and plant in this area bits of old pottery old manuscript which had made up a kind of um, equivalent Egyptian hieroglyphics that the, the children had <laughs> decipher we had feathers we had all sorts of things as they deciphered the so they would we would take them up in teams they would scavenge around they would find all this evidence they would bring it back to the art center those that were in the deciphering team would then decipher the manuscripts which told them more about how this tribe had lived, what they wore, and then we had a team of children who then did the drawings of their costumes and, and their way of life. They turned out to be a, a tree-living people, so then they had to work out how they did things if they lived in trees. And it was just amazing, and we had um, one of the team that we had, one of the volunteers we had, was a, a fantastic prop maker for uh, BBC television. And so he worked with the children reconstructing re, um, different vessels, you know, different <laughs> things. And then by the end of three days, we had this whole museum set up to their Seti tribe and all their paints arrived. And then and they had to label everything. They had to set everything out and they reconstructed the life of the, that tribe in the art center. Fantastic project. Oh, what fun that must have been. Oh, yes. Yes, and the and what the kids learned. Wow, that I'm sure many of them still carry that. Absolutely, I mean all the different all the different things that they learned about how you actually explore somebody's history, you yeah. know, vision, in writing, all that. It was it was great. So those kind of projects. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that. So what makes you move on from that? I mean, I I do that the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, well, because after you've done three days with a hundred children, you're exhausted, Gary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll buy that. <laughs> um, so I moved on from the Arts Centre and became um, Arts Development Officer in another town in England called Northampton. And there, that was quite interesting because what happened, there was an old community in Northampton itself, but they had then built a whole range of, of new estates and had moved people out of London from what were more kind of slum areas where there's poor housing into these new houses in Northampton. And so you had a divided community, so to speak. You had a whole lot of newcomers who hadn't, um, who'd always lived in an inner city. And then you had this um, community that had been brought up in the old town itself. And basically what we were doing there was trying to connect these two communities. And again, we did that through the arts. So we did, you know, we would do craft picnics so people could come out on a sunny day and we would have weaving and spinning and people would work together because in the new new areas there was lots of open spaces so we used those to tempt the people from the from the older part of the town out into the new areas to see what they were like and then we did things like um a teenage project which we called not just hanging about which is where we got the children to take over the or the young ones to take over the town hall which was in the city itself and in, in that, they did a, a, a art exhibition, they did dance workshops, they did music events, and they basically ran for a week a whole festival of arts that was all devoted to the talents of teenagers. 
but they did that in the city hall. So then th this was this was your launching point for uh, your efforts to connect people in communities and yes. and help them understand each other and work together. Exactly. And obviously, at, the, at, at this point, as we're talking 1980s here and 1980s, there were also a lot of people who had come from elsewhere, had come from other countries, from, you know, Afro-Caribbean or Indian or Pakistani, etc., had come from a range of other countries. So, again, a lot of the projects were about integrating those cultures. And in that, needlework, of course, has a, has a, has a good part to play because um, of the skills that are around in all those communities. Yeah. Do you find do you find that to be the needlework to be really kind of the the entry point the icebreaker for these things is that why it, it you use it so frequently it just helps you connect people without because there's got to be language and cultural problems that That's right the wonderful thing about sewing is you don't need language right people can sit and sew together companionably sharing uh, they, they they can see what each other is making they can uh, help each other. They can encourage each other. They can appreciate each other without necessarily having to have conversation. And I think also that works for people who are maybe socially shy or have got maybe had a mental illness and aren't as confident socially. Mm -hmm. That again, you don't need to have eye contact when you're sewing. That you're, you know, you're, you're looking at your work, but you're companionable with other people and nobody minds that you're not talking. Everybody's just getting on with what they're doing, and and you know you you obviously have social aspects of making tea and coffee and you know and and watching something. If I'm making a a large wall hanging or a banner, then then people are all party to to assembling that piece together. So while while they might be working on an individual part, then they connect when they see all their pieces coming together into a whole. So it's a, so it's a very good medium. For, as you say, cutting across barriers that are language barriers or social barriers uh, or age barriers between people, I think. Yeah. Talk to me. I, I don't have an orientation toward banners and wall hangings, yet that plays an integral part in, in so much of what you do. Talk yes. to me about that, that whole approach, because I find it's fascinating to me. Well, the reason I, I – I, well, there's different – reasons I, I really like that medium I like that medium because it's public and as I say my my community arts work what I was very keen to do was to showcase the talents of local people and if you want to showcase it you have to make something that is made to be public and to go into a public space because you can do something in a local area but then it, it maybe won't be seen further afield and what I really want to do is to create help people create pieces of work that would be shown in city centres or big shopping malls or in museums and for them to have a public place for what they had created. Mm -hmm. uh, so as part of that, the scale of a wall hang or a banner allows it to be big enough to then demand a space in a big building. It's as simple as that. The other part of it is I work mainly in the technique of applique, and I do that because, again, with the plique people, as, as I said before, are able to make their individual contribution. And then those different pieces, whether that's um, if it's a, a wall hanging about a place that people live, it will have little cameos about people's lives, both past and present. And maybe it might have buildings in that area. It might have... Um, uh, um, things about local groups and activities and people then are working on their own little part of that something that is relevant to them and then those all those things come together and it's almost as if you're in a material sense building a community together when you make that as a, as a wall hanging or a banner and then you've you've taken that as a, a a community thing, but then you've also had several people who have told their own stories in one way or another through some of your projects. Yes, I did a project just a couple of years ago, which was called Material Matters. And as part of that, what I asked people to do, it was just, I worked with a dozen people, and what I asked them to do was to make a small panel that basically told the story of a textile that was really precious to them in some way. And um, and then we exhibited that both in the um, Scottish Storytelling Centre in Edinburgh, 
and the Glasgow Women's Library here in Glasgow. And what people made, each one was very different. Um, a woman called Israat, she had come from Pakistan to marry in Scotland. And when she'd left Pakistan, her mother gave her a tiny little dress that was that she had made for her when she was a newborn. And she kept it for her through life. And then when she left to come to Scotland, she gave it to her. And Israat said that still, when she wants to get close to home, she takes that little dress out and just, you know, strokes it and handles it. Mm -hmm. And it comforts her because it's got the feeling of her mother within it and it's got the sense of home. Um, so she made one about that little dress and made a replica of that little dress for her panel. Another woman, Kathleen, had the medal that her grandfather was given in the First World War. And he had gone, um, I don't know if you heard of War Horse, the story about the, yes. the young soldiers that went, and well, he was one of those young, young lads who went out with the horses as did his two brothers because they came from a farming community in Scotland and his two brothers had died in the war, but he had survived. And when he died, he left her his Medal of Valour. So she made a medal, she made a, a panel that had um, a replica of that, of that ribbon that, that the medal hung off, but also had photocopied onto fabric photographs of the two uncles that had died and of her father. And then she had embroidered a, a red poppy of remembrance and also then appliqued on very beautifully um, uh, the, on the medal itself is this, is this lovely angel of protection. And she did a appliqued version of that angel on that panel. These things have to be incredibly therapeutic for for people. Yes, incredibly therapeutic and also incredibly moving, I think, not just for the people who make them, but for those who are part of that group who are watching what each other are making and hearing the stories behind them. And quite often now I do community sessions where I ask people to bring a textile that is precious to them and tell its story. And that can be an extraordinary session because people bring all sorts of things. Um, either things that they've been left through family or things that um, that they've made themselves or it might even be something they've picked up somewhere else on a particular holiday which had a special memory for them and then they tell the story behind it. It's a lovely session to do. You might, you might, you can steal that one, Gary. Okay. Because, All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, sounds like you have to have at least two boxes of tissue next to you, though, to hear those stories. You do, because you do you, you do find yourself welling up because, as I say, stories can be very poignant, you know, particularly people who are maybe are refugees and have got something that, that they've brought with them from their homeland and carried across very treacherous journeys but kept this small piece of embroidery safe because of what it means to them. Yes. <laughs> that's See, that's something here. I, I live in the, you know, the, the Midwest of America in – rural or in suburbia and i just don't encounter and never have encountered the diversity that you've experienced and so you know i can see how you're not only are you is it therapeutic but a way for these people to stay attached to the home to their homes to their home culture and and Absolutely. keep keep that alive for themselves keep that alive and also by sharing the story of that, basically, it, it, it be able to, to tell other people what matters in their culture, what their traditions are. What, I mean, there's so, uh, uh, you know, there's so many fantastic traditions behind sewing. It's not just the sewing itself. It's the way that it's sewn, you know, things like the, the Kanta quilts that uh, they make in Bangladesh, where, where you layer old saris and... and um, uh, to, uh, together, you unpick them and then embroider, embroider through three layers of fabric um, new motifs of blessing. And those canter quilts are used as for a, a, for a bride or as a, as a present for a newborn. Uh, but within them is the spirit of past generations because you're using old material. And that old material, they believe, carries the strength and the um, blessings of those that have gone before. And and it, so you've got that idea of this reinforced force of goodwill towards the person that the, the quilt's been made from. I love that kind of thing where the, 
the the reason behind the way it's made has got something that's much more spiritual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What a what an interesting life you lead! So much fun, and and difference making, difference making. I think is more 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 than fun. Difference making. It's uh, has to be incredibly rewarding. Yes, absolutely. And and the only the only downside is the hole I have in my finger because I find it very difficult to use a thimble. So. <laughs> <laughs> so well, you have a place to put the needle if you have a hole. So that's good. <laughs> Uh huh. So, what what are you doing these days? What uh, what is your current world like? Uh, well, I've just finished making my final banner. I'm putting down my my uh, my banner making life uh, because I really want to concentrate on my writing now. And that's not to say I'll, I'll obviously I will never stop sewing. Uh, but uh, so I've just done a banner for the Disabled Workers Committee here in Glasgow, and. Um, uh, and and that's to say is going to be my final banner. And actually, I've just finished doing a master's in historical research at the University of Stirling, and I've done that on the embroidery of Mary Queen of Scots because I planned that to be my next book. My next book is going to be about Mary Queen of Scots and her textiles because when I was writing Threads of Life, I got completely fascinated by Mary Queen of Scots. Okay, of, first, of, first copy sold right here. Yes. Yeah. So obviously I knew about her life, but I hadn't realised how largely textiles featured in both her as part of her political agency and as part of her emotional life. And I don't think many people realise that. And I thought that will be my next book because it's fascinating, totally fascinating. Well, I was so glad that, that I think that's the second chapter in your book because uh, I was so glad to see that because I... I mean, I am not a history buff. I'm a science uh, student. You know, my degrees are in science, and uh, I'm just not a history person. But I've always wondered, what is the big deal about this Mary Queen of Scots? Because she pops up time and time again and seems to be one of these fascinating characters in history. And, yes. uh, and it was, oh, it was really only about a month ago. I was rifling through Netflix, I think it was, looking for a movie to watch. And there was this one about Mary Queen of Scots. I thought, all right, I've got an afternoon here. I'm going to put this thing on and I'm going to, for once once and all, for all, at least get an idea of who this woman was and what she did and why people continually talk about her. And wow, what a life. Uh, what? And, not, and not good. <laughs> not good. I mean, her, you know, to, you know, Basically, to think that she was, you know, had to leave Scotland at the age of five, married at seventeen. Her mother died at that age. The Dauphin, who she married, died a year after their wedding. She then came back to Scotland. She then married Lord Darnley. He then was blown up in an explosion. She then married Lord Bothwell, and, and who the Scottish nobles were totally disapproved of. And so then she, you know, went up in, in battle against them, lost the battle, ran for refuge to England, and then was imprisoned by Elizabeth I for the rest of her life, and then had her head cut off. It wasn't a great life. No, <laughs> no, yeah, and that's. I think that's pretty much how the movie ended. Yeah, getting her head cut off. Yeah, um, tough way, but but still, uh, to this day, a tremendous impact uh, on history and. And people's respect for her and what she went through, it's, uh, it's, it's remarkable. Absolutely. For such a young one. So she, she took up the throne of Scotland, her active throne in Scotland when she was 18. And then uh, basically by 25, she'd become prisoner. And so in those seven years, um, she tried her best to basically bring a, a kind of religious peace within the country between Protestant and Catholic. Um, and it failed at every count for a number of reasons, you know. And, and um, but she was so young and um, thrown to the wolves at such a young age, so to speak, you know. Right. And, 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 and no, I, she never really got to know her son, did she? She never. She she said goodbye to her son when he was two, and she never saw him again. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, and it was only when he became uh, James VI of Scotland and the first of England that he then reclaimed her and 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 basically then got her 
body reinterred in Westminster Abbey in London alongside Elizabeth I because he'd been brought up to believe she was a bad person. And um, and then it was only when he became an adult and could find out more about her life and what had happened to her that he began to understand that she had been a political victim in many respects. Yeah, yeah. Victim is being kind. <laughs> that, um, yeah. But then tapestry, uh, needlework, throughout her whole life, uh, just a, a powerful tool for her for communication and pa- therapy. Oh. Yes, I mean it was a it was a needlework in those days. Embroidery in, in those days in, in Renaissance times was an elite noblewoman's art. So it wasn't something that, that everybody did. Obviously, everybody sewed because everything that they had, that they wore, that they had in their homes, had to be hand sewn. But it was only the very rich who could afford the silk embroidery threads and the finer needles. And so it was very much, uh, as I say, an elite woman's noblewoman's art. And also, because in Renaissance time, in, it was a the, needlework was a language. It was a language through which you could then be that through the the bed hangings that were embroidered and appliqued, be that through the, all the kind of table covers and chair covers, etc., that they made or were made. Then it was a way of expressing who you were, the dynasty you belonged to, what your aspirations were in life, and your education. And that's exactly what Mary Queen of Scots did, as did the other noble women of her of her era. Uh, but when she became imprisoned, she began to use it as a way to smuggle out messages to her supporters. So very interesting in the way that she, because that needlework was so emblematic, so you could then hide within it codes of meaning, which yeah. others could read. Yeah. And we've lost that language. Uh, now, largely, obviously, within some traditional cultures, it still exists. They can read the language of needlework, but we've largely lost it. Yeah, and too bad, too bad for that. Do we have uh, any of her, much of her work, uh, still existing? There is some of her work still existing. There's um, in Norfolk in Oxburgh Hall, a thing uh, is a is a panel, a set of panels called the Marian Hangings. And that is needlework that she did. So it's, it's either for cruciform shapes or um, hexagons uh, in which she has embroidered o- her own um, what, what's called an impressa, which was the emblem that she chose, which is of marigolds. So she would have, you know, drooping marigold, marigold, marigolds turning their faces to the sun. Um, and uh, she also then embroidered uh, the thistle for Scotland, the rose for England, uh, lilies for France, the fleur de lis. Uh, she's got a little embroidery of a dolphin, which is a word play on or visual play on dauphin, the French word for prince, who of course she married. And um, so there's in, in her needlework of hers that exists. There's basically uh, emotional uh, um, significance in terms that she's trying to keep hold of in imprisonment who she was who she belonged to, where she came from, the royal houses that she belonged to, and also the people that she'd loved. Yeah, that's, um, well, we'll talk about it uh, next week when we talk about your book, that therapy aspect of of needlework and basically helping people keep their sanity in difficult times. Uh, Yeah, so, so, all right, we uh, we have a college degree in a subject you never explored, drama, Community activities, and now writing. What what leads you to writing? Well, when I was in theatre, I mean, when I was a student, I did writing as you do when you're young. You know, the the heartfelt poetry that pours out of you in your first, you know, uh, you know when you lose your first love. So I did all that, and then when I went to theatre, I, I did quite a lot of youth theatre, and sometimes I would write small plays for the children I was working with, and then. Uh, I've always thought that I would like to end up writing in my life. And mm. I saw that in at Dundee University, they had a course that you could do on creative writing. I thought it was just one, um, sub, you know, that I was just going to do one of the, the subjects. But then when I went to do it, I just loved it so much, Gary. I thought, actually, I'm actually going to do my master's. And so I did the other subjects as well, which were all to do with writing practice or study. (laughs) And for my final dissertation for that course, for my master's, 
I didn't have a novel kind of burning inside of me that was waiting to be written. And I thought, I'm going to write the book, which I've always wanted to write, which is about why we sew. Because out there, as you know, there are thousands and thousands of books about sewing, about needlework, about needlework history. But actually in them, it never, none of them ever answer the question, why we do it. And mm-hmm. that was that that I was most interested in. Why why have people sewn? Why have people taken the time and used their talents in that particular medium? Um, and what's the, what's the social significance or political significance of that in different communities at different times? And so I thought I'm going to for my dissertation write about that. And when I did it, I they 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 basically they loved it and they said you should turn this into a book. And that was the trigger. And I thought, well, why not? I'll do that. Now, I didn't know it would take me three and a half years at that point. <laughs> I thought I was very, very cocky and thought I already knew quite a lot about needlework because I curated exhibitions on, on community sewing and political sewing and I made banners. I knew quite a lot of history to do with, you know, different aspects of needlework. But actually, when I got started... I realised that although I knew something, I didn't know very much at all. And as is the delight of that of, of research, once you start to dig deeper, you discover more and more interesting stories. And that's what it was like for me that I, you know, everything I looked at. And because now we do have Google, and you can actually, you know, you could get across the world. You could look at different, you know, unearth all sorts of really interesting things. And um, so, the, so the research was a joy and a difficult part was stopping the research and actually writing the book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm so anxious to explore that with you next week because I have to believe that that was the tough spot. When do I stop this? Absolutely. And actually, you never stop. You, I'm still finding out things. Thinking, oh, I could have put that in. But uh, but that's the joy of it, as I say. Um, and, um, and, and so now it's just a, a different kind of research, historical research, right. which is much more difficult because you have to do all that. Uh, I had to do a course in paleography, which is learning about old handwriting, because, of course, in the um, 16th century, which is where I am, then um, everything's handwritten. And to try and find out more information about Mary and her textiles, I have to go back to those original documents. And uh, and read it in 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 the original, which is hard. Yeah, well, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. And terrible writing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Claire. Thanks so much. This has been this has been fun. And thanks to the attic for sponsoring us. And then uh, we'll be back again next week with Claire to spend an hour talking about threads of life and how that came to be and. All of her experiences, and and I'm most interested in the research on that. That's um, got to be a story to tell just in itself. Thank you very much, guys. It's been lovely speaking to you. All right, and thanks to everybody for listening. <laughs> <laughs>